I welcome you to the 2020 Summer Franciscan Zoom Lectures hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Dr. Darlene Prides has taught at FST since 2001 in the areas of history and spirituality. She has published three books and several articles in the history and spirituality of lay Franciscans. She is herself a lay affiliate of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. In her spare time, she volunteers as a lay chaplain and, and care, uh, caregiver in hospice. Tonight, she will be offered some findings from her current writing on emotional range in the Franciscan tradition in this talk, which is entitled, Ongoing Conversion and the Role of Emotions in Franciscan Spirituality, Franciscan Joy. I welcome Dr. Pride. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everybody, for showing up. I appreciate it. You know, there could be a, an alternative title for this talk tonight, and that might be Finding Joy in the Midst of Chaos. Just wondering, in these days of pandemic, how much joy are you experiencing? And how many other emotions are you experiencing? So we can get into this topic of Franciscan joy. I'd like to start with a meditative reading of a poem from Jan Richardson. It's called Blessing in the Chaos, and I thought it was most appropriate for this day in the middle of July 2020. So I invite you to make yourself comfortable. Perhaps plant your feet firmly on the ground to find a place of grounding. If you'd like, close your eyes. Take a deep breath and let it go. To all that is chaotic in you, let there come silence. Let there be a calming of the clamoring, a stilling of the voices that have laid their claim on you, that have made their home in you, that go with you even to the holy places, but will not let you rest, will not let you hear your life with wholeness or feel the grace that fashioned you. Let what distracts you cease. Let what divides you cease. Let there come an end to what diminishes and demeans and let depart all that keeps you in its cage. Let there be an opening into the quiet that lies beneath the chaos, where you find the peace you did not think possible and see, see what shimmers within the storm. See what shimmers within the storm. If anything encapsulates Franciscan joy, it's these words. See what shimmers within the joy or within the storm. They re these words reveal an important aspect of Franciscan spirituality that I'd like to explore with you. We have become accustomed to recognizing poverty with Franciscan spirituality, beauty with Franciscan spirituality. But I'd like to bring forward the role of stillness and opening up into our understanding of Franciscan spirituality, especially as it leads to Franciscan joy. We know that Franciscan spirituality is often encapsulated in the canticle of the creatures. But what we might forget is that the canticle of the creatures in which Francis praises our God through all of creation. Praise to you, Lord, through brother, son, through sister, moon. This recognition that creation offers us opportunities to praise God really comes at near the end of his life. It actually is an expression of Francis's mature faith. 
In addition, this notion of perfect joy that we know from some of the late pieces around Francis, especially from the 14th century, it's an expression of Francis's mature faith. He had to live a life to get here. So from the 14th century, from the little flowers of St. Francis, we have this rendering of what perfect joy is. On a walk from Perugia to Santa Maria degli Angeli with Brother Leo, Francis and Leo were walking along on a cold winter day. They were cold, it was wet, possible to be miserable. Francis picks up a conversation with Leo and says, Brother Leo, if one of the friars should be a great example of holiness and great teaching, please write down that that is not perfect joy. It's not perfect joy. A little while later, he said, oh, Leo, if one of the brothers were to bring sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, or even raise the dead, please write down that not this is perfect joy. A little while later and a little louder, oh, brother Leo, you need to know that if one of the friars knew all of the languages, all of the academic disciplines, all of scripture, if he could prophesy and reveal all truths, this, no, not even this is perfect joy. Oh, brother Leo, little lamb of God, if a brother were to speak, with the tongue of an angel. No, not even this is perfect joy. After a while, Leo says, do you mind if I ask for God's sake, what is perfect joy? And Francis says, it's this. When we come to Santa Maria degli Angeli, soaked with rain, frozen from the cold, covered with mud, suffering from hunger, and we knock on the door of the place and the porter comes out angrily and says, who are you? We are two of your brothers. No, you're not, you're two scoundrels, get out of here. When we wait patiently and endure these insults, cruelty and abuses, without becoming upset, without complaining about him. When we think humbly about the porter, Brother Leo, write this down. This, this is perfect joy. If we endure all of this patiently and with happiness and with good love, and think humbly of the porter. This, this is perfect joy. If we endure all of these things patiently and with happiness, thinking of the suffering of the blessed Christ, which we must endure for his love, oh, Brother Leo, write that here and in this place, that, that is perfect joy. Above all the graces and gifts of the Holy Spirit, which Christ grants to his friends, is that of conquering our own selves and gladly doing so for the love of Christ, to endure sufferings and injuries and insults and difficulties. That is perfect joy. But it took a lifetime for Francis to reach this state of perfect joy. It took a long pathway, a pathway of lots of experiences, of lots of challenges, and yes, little joys along the way. 
we as followers of Francis are are stuck with asking how did he reach this perfect joy? The texts don't give us full answers. We have to follow along in his life story to see that he used his life experiences to achieve joy. Now, many centuries later, we're actually challenged because we know what he let go of in order to be filled with Christ. We know his answers if we've read the texts. It's possible that we might jump ahead and not attend to our own process of transformation, ongoing conversion. It might be possible for us to grasp the kernels of his perfect joy in embracing all of creation and come to a conclusion that, that joy is really mere cheerfulness, mere happiness, or mere animal loving. So it's important to attend to the lifelong story of Francis, to experience that this conversion he went through, this conversion he endured to reach perfect joy, it took a lifetime for him to get there. Letting go of expectations, letting go of relationships, letting go of habits in order to find a new way. Tonight I'll be turning to the hagiographic stories of Francis because they reveal details about his life, at least in terms of what his his followers believed about his life. So we can see how he changed over time, how this process of conversion affected his experience of little joys, these qualities of joys that deepened and matured over his lifetime as his original foundation, his original life plan was chipped away. Now, we know from these, these uh, legends of his life that as a young man, Francis was rather happy-go-lucky. He experienced a kind of joy that was free-spirited, fun-loving. In the legend of the three companions, we know that he was enamored with the idea of becoming a knight, and he was sure that that would happen. He set off with great joy, the text says, great joy on a journey to Apulia to be knighted. He was even more cheerful than usual, prompting many people to wonder what was going on with him. When asked about his outlook, he was beaming with joy and answered, I know I will become a great prince. Those of us who know the story of Francis, we know he didn't get far. He, went, he got to Spoleto and fell ill. And during this period of illness, he was asked, who can do more good for you, the Lord or the servant? Why are you abandoning the Lord for the servant? And at least in this text, we see that Francis considered all of, his, all of his options and quickly returned to Assisi, buoyant and happy and ready to follow God's call. But we know that conversion wasn't easy. In this statue of Francis's parents, we see the chains that his mother Pika took off of him in, that bound him by his father. His father had so many expectations for the, his son, wanted him to follow in his footsteps, follow in the business. He was chained to a certain life. Leaving those chains and leaving those expectations was not easy. In fact, Francis experienced the wrath and anger of his father. And when you experience anger like this, it rests inside of you, it stays inside of you as a life experience. 
This is not a happy-go-lucky young man who leaves his family. This is a grave and serious decision. And it was received with much volatile emotion from his father. Everything that he had been reared to be, everything he had been trained to do, he was turning his back on and this foundation for his life was chipping away. We know that in Francis's conversion to a life of religion, he did find great joy in all of creation. And it's simple, it's easy for us to make these stories into sentimental animal stories, isn't it? But this image by Michael Devine, I think, really points to something much more precious, something much more tender and sacred. We see the halos around each of the animals surrounding Francis that sacrality of life, of all of creation, is something that Francis was moving towards in his earliest periods of conversion. Just tell a couple stories, including one of a cricket. There are several cricket stories, and even saying the word cricket is a little lighthearted. Crickets flop around, they, they hop around, a cricket lived in a fig tree by his cell of the Holy One of Francis, and it would sing frequently with its usual sweetness. Once the Blessed Father stretched out his hand and gently called it to him, Sister Cricket, come to me, come. And the cricket, as if it had reason, immediately climbed onto his hand. He said to it, sing, my sister Cricket, sing a joyful song of praise and the cricket sang. It's easy to discount or minimize the importance of this story. Imagining the stillness of heart, the gentleness of being, to call a cricket onto your hand. There is a contemplative way about Francis that is growing that we see in these stories. In another story from the third life of Thomas of Chilano, a little bird nesting, nestling in his hands, heading to the hermitage of Greccio, Blessed Francis was crossing the lake of Rieti in a small boat. Fishermen offered him a little water bird so he might rejoice in the Lord over it. The Blessed Father received it gladly and with open hands gently invited it to fly away freely. But the bird didn't want to leave. Instead, it settled in his hands as in a nest and the saint, his eyes lifted up, remained in prayer. Returning to himself, as if after a long stay in another place, he sweetly told the bird to return to its original freedom. And so the bird, having received permission with a blessing, flew away, expressing its joy with the movement of its body. Again, it's possible to see this as a mere sweet story with a, with a bird. But the Franciscan way is deeply contemplative. Notice that He's at a hermitage in Greccio. The first lecture in this summer program, uh, Father Garrett offered a lecture on Franciscan contemplation. Sometimes we forget that deep contemplation is such an important part of Franciscan spirituality, that inner stillness and that outer stillness that allows the bird to rest in the palm of Francis's hand This is not mere sentimentality. This is a quieting of the heart. A quieting of the heart, a stilling of the body. 
to allow for the appreciation and love of this beautiful bird. Francis is reconstructing his relationships with creation, and as we will see with people, this recreation of relationships to allow for real engagement rather than treating one another in a transactional way. That transactional way, which we might be very familiar with in our world today, that is how Francis had been trained. But he's breaking that apart to allow for the stillness to take over. He's transforming his own education. He's transforming his expectations as he lives from day to day, year to year. He's transforming his very self to, to will to be present to others, to all of creation, but also to be, will to be present to his experiences and to grow from them. Perhaps the most well-known story of this inner transformation from his experiences comes from Francis and his relationship with the leper. We know how important the leper story is for Francis. He, he includes it in his testament. But it's important to know that it started with revulsion. At the beginning, Francis was repelled by the sight of the leper. Among all of the awful miseries of this world, Francis had a natural horror of lepers. And one day, as he was riding his horse near Assisi, he met a leper on the road. He was terrified and revolted. But not wanting to transgress God's command and break the sacrament of his word, he dismounted his horse ran to kiss the leper. As the leper stretched out his hand, expecting something, he received both money and a kiss. Francis immediately mounted his horse, and although the field was wide open without any obstructions, when he looked around, he could not see the leper anywhere. Filled with joy and wonder at this event, within a few days, he deliberately tried to do something similar. He made his way to the houses of the lepers and giving money to each, he also gave a kiss on the hand and mouth. Thus, he took the bitter for the sweet and courageously prepared to carry out the rest. Francis did not rush in this transformation. He did not rush in his changing of his relationship with the leper, no. He took time to grow in compassion, to grow in his ability to bear witness to suffering, including his own. And it is in this growth of compassion and bearing witness to others and to himself, Francis finally recognized the true teacher in the leper. By opening himself up and being vulnerable to change, he allowed for mutual transformation to take place. I love this particular image of Francis and the leper because it's the one image that I see that Francis and the leper are at equal footing, seeing eye to eye, gazing into each other's eyes. That mutuality of transformation is inherent in this image. And it's so often that we forget in our own experiences of ministry and relationship to be vulnerable, to open up ourselves up to mutual transformation eventually brings forward joy.
So how did he find joy? He allowed himself to feel deeply. He did not run away from his emotions. He experienced them. He certainly may have taken time to process them. We know he went to hermitages. We know that he took up a solitary life from time to time to go into deep prayer and deep reflection. But he allowed himself to feel deeply and to be transformed by others. Now we know one of the more famous stories is the Wolf of Gubbio, in which he is asked by the townspeople of Gubbio to come in and he's known as a mediator, a peacemaker, to come in and, and bring peace to the town because this wolf has been creating havoc, has been terrorizing the town. It's important to recognize that, that perhaps another element makes Francis such a good mediator in this case. He had so much experience with an angry father. He understood anger. He understood volatility. He understood that energy. So he could present himself with curiosity and ask the wolf, why? Why are you treating the people this way? The townspeople had been defensive, had charged against the wolf, and that brought the tension even further. But Francis brought a different energy. He brought a different way of being. Probably because of his past experiences with a volatile father, he understood. In these times that we're in, this story resonates deeply for us, and probably warrants its own lecture, but I just ask you, how are you present with anger? How are you present with fierceness? We're experiencing so much anger these days. Is it possible to bring forward a curiosity, to investigate, to ask why? I don't want to be naive. Not every situation warrants this kind of approach or not every person is open for processing anger. But this is something that Francis teaches us and it helps us understand how he was able to bring a peaceful and yes, even a joyful resolution to what became, what had been a, a tension and a problem for the town of Gubbio. In this image, this icon written by Robert Lentz, we see the image of Francis and the Sultan, Al-Malik Al-Kamil, meeting one another. How do we meet a stranger? How do we see one another? Just invite you to look deeply into this image and see how they are gazing at one another. Respecting one another, perhaps even wondering about one another. Bringing mutual respect for their differences, recognizing their differences. And still being able to listen deeply, respectfully to one another. The joy that this brought to Francis and to Amalika Kamil is evident. Mutual respect and wonder. So my question for us to take with us these days is how do we meet a stranger? How do we meet a stranger on the path, perhaps both of us wearing masks, how do we still invite peace and relationship in these challenging times? It's not well known, but Francis, of course, did experience anger along the way, and it's not surprising. He had let go of so much through his life. 
Well, there are many different stories that I could tell. I'll, I'll suffice with one, given our time. This comes, this is probably my favorite story because it comes after Francis had resigned from the leadership of his community. He was asked by one of the brothers, how could you possibly resign from the office? How could you do that? Don't you like us anymore? Francis said, son, oh, I love all of you brothers. I love you as I can. But let me tell you something. If you would follow in my footsteps, I sure would love you more. And I wouldn't make myself a stranger to you. You know, there are some among the prolats who draw the friars in a different direction, placing before them the examples of ancients and paying very little attention to what I had said. If you ever had a conversation and started stewing over it, maybe you thought that, oh, I should have said that, or, oh, I could have added that. Yeah, Francis did the same thing. In addition, he was sick. He was sick in bed that night, and oh my goodness, when we're sick, all kinds of things conjure up in our heads. He was stewing over that conversation, and he shut up in bed, and he said, who are these guys? Who are these guys? They've snatched out of my hands the way of religion that I have taught. I'm going to show them. I'm going to go to the general chapter. I'm going to show them what I think. Hmm. In his last years, he had let go of leadership, but he couldn't really let go. He couldn't easily walk into retirement. Now he still wanted to keep a hand in things. He still had this attachment. Over time, his anger changed into sadness and sobbing and feeling some level of defeat. He said, oh, let them live any way they want. There's less harm and damnation of a few than of many. Whew. Sounds a little bitter, don't you think? Did he remain bitter for the rest of his life? This took place around 1220. No, I don't think so. Do we know how he processed this particular case? We know his habits. We know his habits to withdraw, contemplate, meditate, to still his soul in silence to let go of extraneous tensions. We also know that he turned to trusted companions like Leo. Trusted companion to talk things out with. And from time to time, an anonymous truth teller, a stranger would come up to him and say important truths that would wake him into accountability. All of this shows that he was open to all of his experiences, including anger. His experiences of anger, especially in this case of letting go of leadership of the order, I think is a quality of grieving. He had let go of something vitally important. He was worried, he was concerned, he was frustrated over the future of this this little uh, group that he had founded that had become so big. This anger grew out of a sense of grieving. I think much of his life was one of grieving, of letting go, of deeply feeling the loss and experiencing in time in opening up. When letting go, there's something that's opened up and that void can be filled. For Francis, this is an ongoing conversion, peeling away layers of himself that took 
place over the course of his entire life to become more vulnerable, to become more authentic. This image is of a statue that used to be at Mission Santa Barbara. A sculpture of Francis made out of wood that had been taken out from the ocean. When I used it in a recent workshop retreat that I gave last month, one of the participants pointed out something that I'd like to share with you. We see in this opened heart space, this place that has fallen away in decay, this openness, this wound, this vulnerability. And it's precisely in that place where we see the most color. It's precisely in that place where we see the original color of the wood. So in this uh, image of Francis, we see this opening of the heart space. And we see the authentic color of the wood, the real color of the wood. There's something about authenticity in vulnerability. So we often think that the stigmata is such a great source of joy for Francis, and no doubt it was, but we forget that it is surrounded by pain. The pain that he was experiencing moving into 1224. He had become ill. He had become sick. He was in constant pain. Physical pain, but also psychic pain, psychological pain. He had suffered great self-doubt. fell into a depression. And he wanted some sense, some assurance that God was there, that God was speaking to him. So the stigmata itself is a source of both joy and pain. And now we turn, we turn back to the Canticle of the Creatures, this product of his mature conversion once again, we realize that this was a, a canticle that was composed over years, or over a year, over the last year of his life, when once again he is suffering physical pain. He's recuperating at San Damiano. He's physically uncomfortable, he's blinded, and he realizes that he's being surrounded by rodents. He's in darkness. And what does he do? He finds opportunity to praise Christ, to praise God. Praise to you, my Lord, through brother, son, sister, moon. Praise to you, my Lord, through water, air, all of creation. And then Praise to you, my Lord, through sister death. He does not rush to get here. In fact, he cannot come to this place until days before he dies in 1226, when he adds that last stanza. Praise to you, my Lord, yes, through even sister death. For Francis, it took an entire lifetime to let go of everything. An entire lifetime to open up completely to Christ. So, what is Franciscan joy? It's complex. It's not mere cheerfulness. It's not just happiness. No. It is a full embracing of God's love. Recognizing God's love and offering it to others through compassion, through bearing witness to suffering. It involves letting go. It involves grieving. 
involves uh, moments of doubt. Most of all, it involves opening up to new relationships and new ways of being, letting go of attachments, opening up to a new way. Franciscan spirituality is not static. It involves ongoing conversion, and that necessarily means allowing oneself to be vulnerable. Because it is in this vulnerability that we finally can fully understand Christ on the cross and be embraced by Christ. And this, this is perfect joy. Now, because we are a school of theology and because I'm a professor, I get to give you some homework, I think. So I, I just invite you for your reflection to especially look during these days of the pandemic what are you forced to let go of? Have you been experiencing any raw emotions around this letting go? And is it possible that this is really an opportunity, an opportunity to cultivate curiosity around your experiences of your emotions, to cultivate curiosity around your experience of other people's emotions? especially anger, because I'm convinced that the seeds of Franciscan joy are embedded even there in that anger. So it's been my pleasure to share some of these thoughts with you tonight. I'm sorry about the little glitch with the PowerPoint, uh, but I think I can speak on behalf of the entire Franciscan School of Theology that we are deeply grateful for your support and um, we wish you well and safety. Peace and all good. This is my favorite image of uh, Francis and the leper because they are seeing each other eye to eye. Um, and in most uh, images of Francis and the leper, you'll see Francis higher than the leper. So there's this hierarchical uh, dimension between them, but I really think their relationship was one of mutual transformation. We know that's true. We know that Francis uh, him as his crucial in his transformation. Uh, this is an image uh, of Francis opening himself up to transformation. I love this open heart space. And um, as a somatic exercise in some of my lay spiritual practices classes, we, we practice this opening up because it really is a, a stance of vulnerability. Can you really be open? This statue of uh, Francis and the wolf of Gubbio is, I believe, at Santa Inez, Mission Santa Inez. Um, and then... This is the image of Francis and the Sultan. And I believe you saw the rest of them, right? Yes, that should be correct. Okay. All right. Prides for your lecture, which uncovers the beauty of the vibrant Franciscan tradition 